welcome to the Pulse of my church. I want to ask you guys a question. Um, for those of you who peruse the internet every once in a while, have you ever watched one of the, or maybe a clip from one of the dating podcasts? Those kind of like the Jerry Springer shows of today, right? So that's, uh, exactly. So uh, how many of you guys have watched one of those shows and there's like some girl on the show that's like, she's got an OnlyFans account, she's like producing pornography, putting it out, and, and she has a cross, like she'll have a cross necklace. And then one of the, one, one of the Christian panelists will be like, hey, wait, wait, what is that cross about? And she'll say like, because Jesus is my savior. <laughs> he died on a cross for my sins. And, and, then, and then the Christian will be like, but if Jesus did that for you and you profess, what, why are you producing pornography? And this is, this is every time, I, it doesn't matter what podcast you see, they always respond the same way. Jesus says you're not supposed to judge people and you're judging me, right? And, and it's actually a good uh, uh, accusation, right? Because what she's basically saying is you're being a legalist, okay? You're taking the grace of Jesus Christ and you're putting all these human rules on it. But for those of us who are Christians, it's like, well, wait a minute. Like, but obviously the Christian's right in that, in that situation. And so the question that I want us to ask today is how can we tell the difference between legalism and godliness? <coughs> How can we tell the difference between legalism and godliness? Uh, we've been studying through the book of Matthew, and uh, Jesus has been challenging us. Jesus has been challenging us to actually um, to live according to the way that He wants us to live. Go ahead, go ahead. Jesus has been challenging us to live the way that he wants us to live. And last week, we, we finished off with Jesus saying, And my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Okay? He's basically saying, following me, it is a burden, but it's a lot less than whatever burdens you placed on yourself. But then you're going to run into people that are going to say things like, Hey... Um, how come you're not keeping the Sabbath? Some of you guys uh, may have family members who are part of a, a church called uh, Seventh-day Adventist Church. In Seventh-day Adventist Church, they go to church on Saturday and not on Sunday. Okay? Why? Because the Sabbath is Saturday, right? Like the, uh, the Jews ce uh, celebrate on uh, a Saturday as well. That's what the actual Sabbath is. And so what they'll say is, man, you look at the Old Testament, and you're supposed to be going to church on Saturday and not on Sunday, and if you're not going to church on Saturday, then you're not really saved. And so how can we tell the difference? Are they telling the truth? Or are we doing things wrong and they're doing things right? How can we tell the difference between legalism and godliness? Now, I, I, I want to qualify this. There, there's some people here who grew up in a Catholic church, some people, Eastern Orthodox Church. I love those churches, right? I love those denominations. One of the things I'll tell you is we wouldn't have the Bible today if it wasn't for those institutions. They protected the Bible when people were trying to burn and get rid of Scripture. However, I, I, there are some things that the Catholic Church obviously does differently than us. One of the things that they say is, you must confess to a priest. If you're not confessing to a priest, then you're, then you're out of step with where you need to be uh, in your faith. But is that, legalism? is that legalism or is that godliness? How can we tell the difference between legalism and godliness? There's, uh, there was a, I knew of one denomination that said that it was ungodly to watch movies. It seemed a little extreme, right? I grew up in a Baptist church. I still consider myself Baptist. But one of the things that the Baptists will say is, drinking alcohol is of the devil. You're not supposed to have it. 
Is that legalism or is that godliness? Good question. And if I haven't offended you up until this point, I'll probably offend you at this point. In Scripture, Paul says, uh, man, this is going to be hard to say. Paul says that uh, women shouldn't speak in church. That if they have a question, that they should go talk to their husband and that they should be quiet in church. Well, what's that all about? Right? <laughs> That's a rough one. Should, should women be speaking in church? Like, how can we tell the difference between legalism and godliness? And that's the question that I want us to, to focus on today. I believe that that's what Jesus addresses in Matthew chapter 12. Now, what Jesus is going to talk a lot about is uh, he's going to be talking about the Sabbath. So let me give you guys, before we get into our Matthew passage, let me give you a little bit of... Um, uh, context. So I'm actually going to read from, and we're going to put the words up on the screen, Exodus chapter uh, 31. And so in Exodus chapter 31, verse 12, it says, And the Lord, or Yahweh, by the way, if, you're the, if this is your first time here in the Old Testament, any time there's a capital L-O-R-D, uh, that was actually the name of God. So that's it's all changed. And I say Yahweh. And Yahweh said to Moses, verse 13, you are to speak to the people of Israel and say, above all, you shall keep my Sabbaths, for this is a sign between me and you throughout your generations that you may know that I, Yahweh, sanctify you. And so the context of this is here's, um, here's Moses. He's just led the people out of slavery in Egypt. They're finding out that they are a people. They are God's chosen people. And so it's like, okay, well, how are we supposed to act? How are we supposed to live? How are we supposed to be different from all the rest of the nations? And God says, well, one of the ways that you're going to be different, one of the most important ways is every Saturday, every Sabbath, I want you to rest. I want you to rest in me. And he says, and I want you to take it seriously because this is going to separate you from everyone else. Verse 14, how seriously does God want them to take it? You shall keep the Sabbath because it is holy for you. Everyone who profanes it shall be put to death. I think God wants them to take it seriously. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath, on it, the Sabbath, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Verse 15. Six days uh, shall work be done, but the seventh day is a Sabbath of solemn rest, holy to Yahweh. Whoever does any work on the Sabbath day should be put to death. So this is the Old Testament law. It applied to the Jewish people that are part of the nation. That is the context of the Sabbath. Okay. Now, now that you've got the context of how seriously they took the Sabbath, now let's go to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12, starting in verse 1. It says, At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. Let me kind of paint the picture for you. Jesus and his disciples... Uh, it's the Sabbath. He's on his way to the um, to the not the tabernacle. The what? Synagogue. I'm sorry. Yeah. So he's on his way with his disciples to the synagogue. They're going to go listen to scripture being read. Okay, that's what they would do on on the Sabbath. But on their way, they're walking through the grain fields. Okay. His disciples were hungry. And they began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. Now, this actually tells us a lot. There's a lot going on. They were not stealing this. These, this was not their uh, their field of grain. Okay, This was some other farmer's field of grain. However, according to Jewish law, which Jewish law was actually pretty good to the homeless people and to poor people, one of the things that every farmer was supposed to do is they were supposed to farm the field, and then allow a poor person, if they were hungry, they could come over and snap off uh, some of the grain and eat it so that they could be fed. Okay, that was not considered stealing. In fact, 
the Old Testament would, would tell farmers to actually throw seeds in the corners of, the, of their field, but to not, um, not harvest that because they wanted to leave that for poor people. So one of the things that we actually learned from this is that Jesus and his disciples were poor. They didn't have money. They were hungry. And they snapped up, which was okay according to the law. But here's the problem. They did it on the Sabbath. Dun, dun, dun. Right? Okay. Now that you know the, the context of, of the Old Testament, you go, okay, this is, this is serious. But the question is, is, is that work? Now, I will say this, had they gone in with shears and started shearing off, that would have been stealing because they would actually have been harvesting the grain. It wasn't just snapping off one and feeding yourself. That would be like collecting a bunch of it and taking it home. That would be stealing. Okay. So they were just eating. They were doing what was according to the law. But is that a problem with the Sabbath? Well, the, the Pharisees thought so, verse 2. But when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful to do on the Sabbath. Now that, again, is a huge accusation because what does the Old Testament say? You put them to death. Okay. But verse 3, Jesus responded to them, Have you not read what David did when he was hungry? And those who were with him, verse 4, how he entered the house of God and ate the bread of the presence, which was not lawful for him to eat, nor for those who were with him, but only for the priests. So, so Jesus says, hey, don't you remember that story about David? This is, by the way, this is the same David that killed Goliath. This is the same David that would become the greatest king that Israel would ever, that would ever have. Okay? Don't you remember about that story when David was running away from King Saul because King Saul was trying to put him to death and him and his friends, they had to leave. They didn't have time to get food because they were, they were about to be executed. And so this is before David was king. And so he went to the temple. He, they were famished. They were hungry. They needed energy so that they could keep running from King Saul. And so he went up to the priest and said, hey, I need some bread. In fact, let me read that for you. Uh, 1 Samuel, going back to the Old Testament, back to that story. 1 Samuel chapter 21, verse 3. Now, this is what David said. Now then, what do you have on hand? Give me five loaves of bread or whatever is here. Like, I just need something to eat. And, and I need something to eat for, for my friends. It must have been him and four friends. That's why he was asking for five loaves of bread. Verse 4. And the priest answered David, I have no common bread on hand. But there is holy bread if the young men have kept themselves from women. Now, what is holy bread versus common bread? Common bread was something that everybody could eat. But they had a tradition or they had part of the law of how they were supposed to worship God is in the temple once, once a week they would make this really nice loaf of bread. It was considered holy bread and they would put it before the altar of the Lord. And that was considered a sacrifice. And they would actually leave that bread there for a whole week. But then every Sabbath, they would bake a new piece of bread. And they would go in and they would replace the old one with the new one. And the only people who were supposed to eat the holy bread were the priests. By law. But here's David running for his life. He's hungry. If he doesn't get food for him and his, and, and his four friends right now, they're not going to have the energy to keep running from the king and they're going to be killed. And so it's against the law for them to eat it. Verse 6, but it says, So the priest gave them the holy bread, for there was no bread there, but the bread of the presence, which is removed from before Yahweh, was replaced by hot bread on the day it was taken and so now you can see why Jesus brought this up, right? It's kind of the same thing. Here's his disciples. They're hungry. It's, it's the Sabbath. David was hungry. It was the Sabbath. And there was a greater need than what the tradition was there for. And so Jesus was basically saying, hey, if you, as Pharisees, 
make an exception for David, what about my disciples? He goes on and he says something else. Verse 5. He says, Or have you not read in the law, that means the Old Testament, how on the Sabbath the priests in the temple profane the Sabbath and are guiltless? Jesus is saying, don't you realize that there's somebody who works every Sabbath? It's the priests. The priests are working, but yet you don't find any guilt in them. In fact, I'll read from you. From Numbers chapter 28, this is what it says to the priest on earth. Verse 9, on the Sabbath day, two male lambs, a year old, without blemish, and two tenths of an infant, uh, a fine flour, for a grain offering mixed with oil and its drink offering. I didn't put this next one up on the screen. This is the burnt offering of every Sabbath besides the regular burnt offering and its drink offering. In other words, the priests had to work harder on the Sabbath than they worked during the rest of the week. Now, as Jesus was saying, that you give exceptions for the priests, in the Pharisees' minds they would say, yeah, but they're doing something for the temple. Right? They're doing something greater. They're serving God, so that's greater. Jesus, knowing what they were thinking, said in verse 6, he says, I tell you something greater than the temples. In other words, Jesus was saying, the work that I'm doing is greater than the work that's happening in the temple. And so if there's an exception for the priests, there should be an exception for Verse 7, he says, And if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the illness. In the Old Testament, God said many times, He said, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. The law wasn't just about you following the letter of the law. It's about understanding the law in your hearts. Verse 8, Jesus says, for the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. He's basically saying, I have the authority to talk about this. Oh, my notes are on my... I, I'm going to... Sorry, whoever's on YouTube. I'm going to have to grab this real quick. A man was there with a withered hand. And they asked him, is it lawful to heal on the Sabbath? So that they may accuse him. So they couldn't argue with Jesus before... But they were saying, surely if you healed somebody, that would be work. So in verse 11, Jesus said to them, Which one of you who has a sheep, if it falls into a pit on the Sabbath, will not take hold of it and lift it out? He turned to, to those very Pharisees who probably owned sheep themselves. He said, you know what? You ever had a sheep fall into a pit? Are you telling me that you wouldn't do that on the Sabbath to lift them out? And then, verse 12, he says, Of how much more value is a man than a sheep? So it is lawful to do good on the Sabbath. And then, to add insult to injury, verse 13, And then he said to them, Stretch out your hand. Excuse me. And the man stretched it out, and it was restored, healthy like the other man. Verse 14, the Pharisees went out and conspired against him on how to destroy him. And so here's Jesus. He's saying, listen, you guys are making things too complicated. That was not the heart of God from the very beginning. It was not to make things more complicated. So in verse 15, Jesus, aware that they were trying to accuse him and destroy him, he withdrew from there, not because he was afraid of them, not because he was a coward, but it, it wasn't time for the grand confrontation, if you will. And so many people followed him and he healed them all. It wasn't like they started coming. He goes, guys, I, I got to, you know, I kind of got people watching me right now. I really can't do this. He didn't do that. He healed all of them, verse 16, and ordered them not to make him known. In other words, don't go, go around talking about it. But he kept healing people because it was the right thing to do. Verse 17, this was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. 
Isaiah was a prophet from the Old Testament. 800 years before, he had actually written about what the Messiah would do. And this is what he said, verse 18. God had said through Isaiah, Behold, my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved with whom my soul is well pleased, I will put my spirit upon him, and he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. Right? This heavy burden from the, uh, uh, from the Sabbath was that Jesus was actually proclaiming justice. Verse 19, he will not quarrel or cry aloud, nor will anyone hear his voice in the streets. Okay? Jesus was not going to be a brawler. But it said he was gentle. Verse 20, a bruised reed he will not break. If any of you have been, ever been out to the Everglades, you, you'll see some, sometimes there'll be like a plant. And if it's bruised, okay, if you're not super careful with it, it'll break. And what it's saying is, is that the Messiah would be so gentle that he would not break people who are already broken. Verse, uh, and continuing, and a smoldering wick he will not quench. So have you ever had a candle go out, but right before it goes out, there's no flame, but there's like a little, like a little piece of light and there's smoke coming out. And if you do anything, it's done. What Isaiah was saying is that the Messiah that will come, he will be gentle until he brings justice to victory. Verse 21, and in his name, the Gentiles. And so back to my original question. How can we tell the difference between legalism and godliness? And, and here's what I find in Scripture. Jesus simplifies your life. Jesus is not here to complicate your life. He simplifies your life. Later on, Jesus actually says, the Sabbath was not made for man. I'm sorry, the man was not made for Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for man. In other words... Man was not created to serve the Sabbath. The Sabbath was actually created to serve man. And, and this whole rest thing was something that we need. Now, here's what I will tell you. The reason why we don't celebrate the Sabbath today, well, we kind of do. We just do it through Jesus. Jesus did not come to abolish the Old Testament law. He came to fulfill the Old Testament law. What do I mean by that? Well, all the sacrifices that you see, he was the ultimate sacrifice. The Sabbath, the peace that we were supposed to have on the Sabbath, we actually find peace through Jesus. Jesus is our Sabbath. And so I think everybody should come to church on Sunday. I, I, I really think that every Sunday you should make every effort you can to be in church. I think it's good for you. It brings you peace. But I don't think you should be put to death if you don't. You gotta work, you gotta work. But I will say, tell you this <clears throat> people who don't make a commitment to come to church on Sunday <clears throat> often find themselves really drunk on Saturday night. But people who do make a, a commitment are usually like, eh, I'm done for the night, I'm going to church in the morning, right? Like, like, like that's a good thing. <clears throat> So I don't want to be a legalist about it, but understand that Jesus is supposed to simplify your life. I hate hoses. <laughs> How many of you guys have ever gotten like a hundred foot or fifty foot hose and it looks like this right in the middle of it? Right? Like this is not so bad because the ends are right here, but, but when you've got like fifty feet that way and fifty feet this way, <clears throat> half the time you're just like, yeah, I'll just use it with a not in the middle of it, right? How many of us have a hose that maybe looks like this at home? Or, or hey, even better, a uh, an extension cord. Does anybody have an extension cord that looks like this? And it's been like that forever, and you're just like, no, I'm not going to do it. Ladies, how many ladies here have a really fine necklace that gets like this, and you don't want to throw it away, but it's sitting there? How? Come on, be admitted. How many ladies here? You know what I'm talking about. You know what's great uh, about a knot like this? It's a pain. Most of us, we leave it alone because we don't have to deal with it. 
And at first, when you start trying to deal with it, it can be frustrating. It doesn't feel like you're making your life simpler at first when you start taking this knot apart, right? But how many of you worked on a knot long enough and it starts coming apart? And you know that feeling that you get to feel, yes, yes, it's coming apart, right? And it feels so freeing when, when you finally get it apart. That's the way that Jesus wants to handle your life. So when we talk about the, 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 the girls you know, on those dating podcasts, you know what Jesus wants to do? Is he, he, wants, he wants to start untangling their lives. But here's what happens is they go, oh, um, that doesn't feel good at first. It doesn't feel like God is uncomplicating my life. It feels like he's complicating. But in the long run, if we begin to live life the way that God wants us to live, we find freedom in Jesus Christ. That's how you can tell the difference between if somebody is being a legalist and if somebody is being holy. Because in the end, if you do it long enough, it should simplify your life. So let's go through all of our examples. So for instance, keeping the Sabbath. Again, I think it's good to go to church on Sunday. You don't have to. But I think it's good for you. I think it simplifies your life when you start the week by worshiping God. Confessing to a priest. I actually don't think it's bad to, to confess. In fact, Scripture says that we should confess to one another. But it never says that we have to go to a priest to do it. That's something that the Catholic Church kind of added on afterwards. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of theirs. Okay? I'm not against them. But that's why I, I don't want you guys to come confess to me. I don't want to know. Okay? <laughs> Find a good friend of yours and work it out between the two of you. Okay? Because at the end of the day, Jesus simplifies your life. He doesn't make it more complicated. Not watching movies. I'm, I'm sure that there's... A lot of movies that we probably shouldn't watch, but that's something that we should make that determination on our own. Jesus simplifies your life. When the Southern Baptists, that's how I grew up, don't drink alcohol. There are some of us who are here today who either we have an addiction or we know somebody who's got a really heavy addiction. I can see where if you had a small town and everybody had like this really bad addiction to alcohol and then the, the small church inside that, that little town said, you know what, we're going to take a stand. We're not going to drink alcohol to be an example to those who are suffering right now. I think that's a good thing. But then for that church to go visit another church in the next town over that doesn't have that same problem and, and say, well, you guys are sinning because you're not having, I think that that's wrong. Because Jesus is not here to complicate your life. He's here to simplify your life. The one that all the women are waiting for. <laughs> Speaking in church. I used to explain that one away. But you know, I've been a pastor for the last 20 years. And every married woman who is a Christian I've never met a married Christian uh, woman who doesn't want her husband to be the spiritual leader of the household. And I, I haven't met one yet. Maybe I'm sure that, there, that there's one out there. But almost every one of them has a desire. I want my husband to be the spiritual leader of the house. But over and over again, over the last 20 years, I've had uh, you know women who have husbands who are going to church. They come up to me. The women come up to me and say, hey, I've got this spiritual question. And I'm a pastor, and I, I'm, a, I'm a Bible geek, and so I'm like, yeah, 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 let, let's talk about Scripture together. But I'm going to be honest with you, over the last, over the last year, I've started to get convicted. Like, it's not right to leave your husband out of this process, right? And so I've started, if it is a married woman who comes up to me and says, hey, I've, I've got this spiritual question, not being a jerk about it, I just go, you know what, go talk to your husband. Ask him. 
And the response is always, well, he's not going to know. And I go, yeah, so have him come talk to you. So that he can become the spiritual leader that you've been dying for him to become. You see, it's not supposed to complicate your life. It's supposed to simplify. Read with me Luke chapter 11, verse 28. He replied, Blessed rather are those who hear the word of God and obey it. Church, I'm going to tell you right now. Following Jesus, it's not easy. But it is simple. You guys know the difference? It's very simple. It's not easy. But it's simple. Jesus was the simple. Let me go ahead and close in a word of prayer. Um, let me have the band come up. And um, Raul's going to do the Lord's Supper with you guys. Let's close uh, together. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much today, Lord. I, I think that a lot of us, I know almost every single one of us, are leading a more complicated life than we need to. Lord, I believe that you want to simplify our lives. But we keep saying no. Because maybe it's uncomfortable. Lord, help us to tell the difference between legalism and holiness. Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would, would speak to us when somebody is trying to get us to do something that's not necessarily biblical. Maybe it, it sounds biblical, but it's not actually biblical. But at the end of the day, Lord, I pray that we would submit to you because at the end of the day, Lord, I believe that it is your heart. You don't desire sacrifice. You don't need the pain of, of jumping through a bunch of hoops. Lord, you, you, you want mercy for our lives. And you want us to live a life of, of simplistic love of you and of our families and of the people who are around us. Lord, I pray that you would help us to begin to undo that knot so that we can lead the simple life that you prayed for us. 